This is Larry Lawton, and he's an ex-jewel thief. Larry's a former career criminal, once considered the biggest jewel thief in the United States. There was a guard, he was doing this once a week. Once a week. The guy made $30,000 as a guard, and now he's making $45,000 every week. Okay, everybody, here is chapter 10, Atmosphere of Violence, and this is part one, and we're gonna make this two part because it's real long. Uh, while I was in Atlanta, this is all gonna be about what happened in Atlanta, some violence. Be honest, I was reviewing my chapter and it, it's rough. This is a rough one because it brings back memories. It brings back some uh, nasty stuff. So uh, I, I got to make it two parts. It was a little rough going through it. You know, I read it for Spotify and I read it for iTunes. Well, I'm going to talk to you about it now. You know, the first thing I, you know, I remember, obviously I'm in Atlanta now and the rats. When I say rats, I'm not just talking about the human kind. I'm talking about the, you know, the animal rats that... We, you know, they had a lot of rodents. Atlanta was built in 1903. It was an old prison. They had let cats in that prison because the the rodents were so bad. The rats were so bad. I mean, they were everywhere. I mean, you you could see them. You'd see them in the hallways. You'd see them in the units. And, you know, uh, I was in Atlanta and I worked in the kitchen. So when you work in the kitchen, you got to get up at 4 in the morning or 3.30 in the morning and they call you to the kitchen and you got to get ready. All the mobsters worked in the kitchen in Atlanta. It was like weird. We didn't do anything. We'd like fill the napkin holders or nothing. We'd pretty much steal. We'd steal a lot of stuff out of the kitchen. You'd steal a bunch of stuff and you'd steal blocks of cheese. You'd steal cantaloupes. You'd steal whatever food you could steal out of the kitchen and bring it back to the unit. People would make sandwiches, steal loaves of bread, stuff like that. So anyway, we had an, a rat in Atlanta. It was well known back in those days. It was called Big Ben. Literally, the rat was huge. This rat had to be this big. It would actually be able to get on its hind legs and put its front feet up on a chair. The thing's body was that big. The tail was that big. It was really thick. I'm fun, funny. I was in the uh, kitchen and I was there and, and, I, and I had a broom or a, yeah, it was a broom. And I was just sweeping up near the door ready to, you know, what they call open for chow. You know, they call people start coming in early, right? When the units start unlocking, they start calling chow units. So you're ready for them. So this is about five in the morning and uh, I'm getting ready. And Big Ben, I see Big Ben walking along a wall. And everybody knew the rat. They tried to poison the rat. They tried to trap the rat. They couldn't get the rat. It was just amazing. It was a, what they call a super rat in today's world. New York City has them too. Uh, in the subway system, but this rat was in Atlanta. So I have a broom and I run right up to it. Like, you know, I'm gonna hit it. I'm gonna hit the rat. It turned around, it looked at me. It, it gave me its teeth, that like fang teeth. I said, what the fuck, man? I, I, I backed off, I literally backed off. Man, it was creepy as shit, I'll never forget it. And the rodents in, in Atlanta, besides the, the, the snitch people that are in every prison, the rodents were just terrible in Atlanta. I mean, they were that bad. Well, when I get to Atlanta, you gotta remember, I was pretty new in the system. I was my first prison besides holdover units and, you know, the air transport and I'd ferret and the school kill all the prisons back. And I'll tell you what, this is the first time I really missed my wife. Uh, I was married. I had a 15 month old daughter at home and, uh, I really missed her, man. I could tell you what, I, your mind plays tricks on you like you have no idea. You think when you're sleeping, you think about certain things. When you're really, I can, I guess, I won't say obsessed, but it's not easy. So I just get over it, you know, and you don't, you know. My uh, now ex-wife and still friend, uh, Missy, she, you know, I told her, move on, get out, you know, move on. You didn't go to prison. I went to prison. I put myself in prison. You didn't go to prison. And it was rough. That was a rough time, man. I remember laying in my cell crying. And, you know, you think you got to act tough, though. You can't show that fucking weakness in prison. You know, people spot weaknesses 
all the time in prison and you can't let that happen. It's amazing, you know, you ha your body has to fight it and you, and you just have to fight it, you know, you, you, you get up in the day, you know, you get up in the morning, you, you, got, you get your boots on, your shoes on and you're ready for the day's, you know, action, whatever's gonna happen. If you're not working, if you are working, you go to your workplace and stuff like that, depending on what prison I was in, but you, ha you can't show weakness as much as it's hard you can't show that weakness and you just can't do it. So it was real hard losing my wife, you know, and you, you will lose your wife. You know, 95% of all people who go to prison get divorced. Hell, the divorce rate on the street is 50%. Now you throw a wall, no money, no communications. It's inevitable. 95% of all people get divorced and go to prison. So while I'm in prison, you start getting into the culture a little bit. I'm in there and I, first of all, everyone thinks, how do you get money? Well, how does money work? I used to get a pension back then from a retired Coast Guard. So I used to give my wife uh, about 300 bucks a month for every month I was in prison, I used to give her that money. And, you know, I still had a few bucks. My dad used to send me my money. So I had money and you get your money and you can go to the commissary with your money. Now, how money works in prison is it's in stamps. A lot of people think it's cigarettes. Cigarettes went way out, you know, 30 years ago, even before my time. Well, they still had them when I was in, in the early days, 96. Guys had cigarettes. They didn't stop selling cigarettes in the Federal Bureau of Prisons until about 2001. But in, in about, uh, but the, it still money was stamps. How that works is a book of stamps at that time might have cost 42 cents a stamp. Uh, I think it was 42 or 41 cents a stamp. But in prison, every stamp is a quarter. So a book of stamps is 20 stamps. That's five bucks. That's all you're going to get for that. But with that money, you can buy a hamburger off the kitchen. The guys who, who make it hustle, they make hamburgers and steal them and bring them back to the units. They get four stamps. You want to buy fruit. Uh, an apple might be two stamps or a stamp, depending on how flush they are at the yard with, with fruit and stuff like that. So it's there all over the place. I mean, you need money. You need money to buy drugs. Obviously, every drug in the book is in prison. We'll get into that in a bit. And you wanna buy sex. I mean, you can actually buy sex in prison. You can buy anything you want. You gamble. Gambling is a big thing in prison, just like I did on the streets. I taught one of the guys in, in Atlanta, a guy named Reno, who's head of the Latin Kings. I taught him how to be a... A uh, bookie in prison, I'll tell you about what happens at the end of this chapter, uh, probably in the next video. But anyway, th this is pretty wild. So you got to know how money. So people have money. Actual new, new guys like me would go to the commissary, you buy three books of stamps. That's all they'd let you buy. And you buy three books of stamps. And now you use that money in the prison any way you want. Buying things. Of course, mailing a letter as well. But mainly it's for prison money. So... I told you about going to Atlanta in the last chapter, I told you about going to the hole. So what people do in the hole is when they go to the hole and gang members will actually send a dude who owes money, they will send them to the hole, literally send them to the hole. But what they'll do is they'll send them to the hole with heroin. They'll be suitcased with heroin and they'll have a bunch of heroin. They'll get into the hole. The first thing they do with the orderlies that are working the hole will come up to the door and say, hey, you got anything? The guy already took it out of his rectum, and he goes, yeah, I got heroin. The guy goes, okay, hold on, what do you need? I need a radio, I need a toothbrush, I need toothpaste, I need uh, whatever, deodorant. In the hole, paper, a pen or a pencil, but you want to get paper to write a letter and stuff of that nature. I need envelopes. And whatever you need in the hole, you got heroin. Well, dudes, gang members would send a dude who owes money, they would send them to the hole, because you make money in the hole. I know it sounds crazy, but heroin junkies still need to get their fix. So the orderly in the hole would be running from cell to cell, you know, bullshit mopping, but they're really, hey, what do you need? I need two papers of heroin. Two papers of heroin is $50. So the dude in the hole, he might've been in a hole for a, a two months already. Now that dude, every, every single commissary time, he's buying three books of stamps. So a book of her uh, a heroin, a paper of heroin costs five books of stamps. So in two weeks, that guy's got six books of stamps and he's gonna give you five books of stamps for those, for that heroin he needs that he's a junkie. So that's how the actual in the hole, 
Plus, they still have street-to-street -street money. Street-to-street -street money is if you owe someone money in prison, you have your people send their people money. So you'd say, hey, listen, I'll have my people send 100 bucks. I need four papers of heroin. Okay, if you trust them, they let it go, and obviously people get killed that way. But if not, you say, okay, they give them the four papers of heroin. The guy gets a phone call once a week in the hole. The guys come up, they actually have a phone that'll come down the tier and they'll pass the phone through the shoot door. The guy will make a phone call and say, hey, listen, hey, I, I'm doing legal work. Uh, send John, here's his address, send him a hundred bucks. And the, you know, the people on the street, they love you, they don't know what's going on, they'll send a hundred bucks to that person, send it either to his people, and when he calls, he knows he's got the money, or they'll literally send it into his account. They'll say, hey, listen, he's doing my legal work. Send him a hundred bucks. And the prison knows what's going on, but they pretty much let that go. You, you'd be surprised at that. So everybody asked me, how do you get so much heroin in prison? How much do you get so much drugs in the prison system? Well, there's three ways I'm gonna explain them to you. First of all, during a visit, a person has a visit and their wife or their girlfriend or whoever, I would never, ever, I mean, why would you put one of your people out there and get them in trouble because if you get caught introducing contraband into a federal prison, it's a five-year sentence. So, you know, how do you let your wife do that? But a lot of guys got girlfriends, pen pals, prostitutes, hookers, whatever they get hooked up with, they'll have that person. That person, a woman normally, obviously, will take heroin, wrap it in cellophane, put it in a cotex, insert it in her vagina, and get into the prison. And then why do they even have to do that? Why can't they just put it in their pocket? One, in case they get searched. Two, the prisons have what they call sniffers. They're actually electronic sniffers that can sniff out drugs. Obviously, if it's on your hands, any residue, you'll get it, but the person does it, they insert it in their vagina in the, the cotex tube wrap. That's a lot of heroin in that little tube. So the lady will do that, bring it into the prison, now, when you go to a prison in a maximum security prison, we have what they call contact visits, but you can only hug right when you leave, get there. You can give them a hug, and then you have to sit down. In some prisons, they make you sit apart, across from them. Some, you can sit next to them. Uh, in Atlanta, at that time, they were making us sit across, but you hug. And when they hug, the, the woman would take before the guy gets out. So what happens is a person goes to gets a, a call for visit. So they got to go down, they strip search going in there. You can't, they strip search you going into the visit. You're forever lifting your nuts, spreading your ass and coughing in prison every day. So anyway, you get called for a visit, they call you down and your, your person is already in that visiting room. So when she's in that visiting room, she already went to the bathroom. She took out that cotex and has that hidden. She'll come up when you get into the prison you know, they see you, you hug your girl. She literally sticks the damn, the, the, the cotex down the back of your pants. Before you go to prison, you actually put a little uh, uh, grease, like a little petroleum jelly or something like that, or Vaseline they sell on the commissary, and you put that on your, your anus. And then a lady will literally slide it up your ass or give it to you and you'll slide it up your ass. And now it's in you again. And the reason it has to be in you is because again, when you leave that visiting room, you are gonna be strip searched. They're gonna take you, strip search you, lift your nuts, turn around, spread your ass, the whole works. It's just the way it is in prison. But you now have heroin up your ass. Now, that's one way they do it. Another way they do it is a woman, she will know that they sell M&Ms in the commissary vending machine. So you think, okay, they sell M&Ms. At this time, they used to let them bring in candy, but it had to be sealed and everything else. So not to give it to you, but it's theirs. They wouldn't they'd just go through their bags. So the girl would have, go to the store, get the exact same kind of M&Ms that are on that, in that vending machine in the prison uh, visiting room. So now the girl goes home, she takes little balls of like condoms and she stacks the condoms, little balls, with heroin or weed or coke or whatever she's bringing in. She'll make the balls real small and she'll fill that M&M bag 
with the, the heroin and then seal it with crazy glue. Now it looks just like a bag of heroin. Couldn't tell. A bag of uh, M&Ms, you couldn't tell. Then what she'll do is when you get into the, vet, into the visiting room, she'll go up to the uh, vending machine. She'll buy a bag of M&Ms. The guys are watching her. People are just like, they're watching. They got cameras, but they're watching. They got a lot of people in the visiting room. She'll give the bag of M&Ms to the inmate. He'll open it and he'll just eat them and drink water, eat them. Beforehand, of course, you don't eat any. He'll swallow all those bags of heroin and bags of uh, uh, cocaine or weed. One guy got caught with 70 balloons in his system, 70 balloons. So anyway, they put them and then they, when they get back into the unit, they shit them out. If you don't eat any, that's gonna go right through your system and come out. And then they wash those balloons off, open them up, and they're the king of the prison. People know when the heroin hit or the coke hit or whatever drug they're bringing in hit. So that's the second way they bring it in. It's pretty ingenious, but that's the way it's done. Third way, obviously, is guards. I watched Reno, who was a drug dealer. He was making 10,000 bucks a month. 10,000 bucks a month in prison. And what he was doing, he was paying a guard a thousand dollars a shipment every time the the guard and he would bring the the it, it, whether it was weed it first started out with weed and then the inmate was actually getting heroin wrapped around the weed the, it, the guard didn't even know he thought he was bringing in weed and he actually put heroin inside he would literally deliver it to, to reno's cell i was there in the cell when it happened i said man this is some operation and the guard would just leave it there in the cell and leave. Nobody would be in there. We'd come back, we'd see him leave. We'd know we'd go back into the cell and sure enough, the package would be there. And the guard was getting money shipped by that person's family. Reno's connection on the street would be sending one, the dope or heroin, whatever it is, to a P.O. box. Now that P.O. box was set up by the guard or whoever it was. Now it was sent to that P.O. box. And, that, and he just went and got it from there. And the money was sent to another account, not to that P.O. box, to another uh, account that the guard had set up. There was a guard, he was doing this once a week, once a week. The guy made $30,000 as a guard, now he's making $45,000 every week, 52,000 or whatever, every week he worked or off weeks or whatever. He's making a ton of money, all cash money doing that. Obviously when they get caught, they go to jail. Most of them don't go to jail. They claim that they were threatened or stressed or whatever the bullshit is going to be. Who are they going to tell on? A dude with a life sentence? What does he give a fuck? I mean, it, it's really, that, that's how the, the, the system works. So there's so much drugs in prison. I get a kick out of people. I tell people there's more drugs in prison than on the street. They go, what do you mean? I go, listen, if you want heroin on the street, what do you do? You might have two dealers in your town or you're within a few mile area. Two dealers. You got to get your car. You got to go down and get your heroin or coke or whatever you're going to do. You got to go get it. In prison, there'll be 15 dealers and they'll be five feet away or the corner cell or they'll go up to the cell up in the second tier or the third cell from the door. That guy's selling weed. That guy's selling coke. That guy's selling heroin. Drugs are readily available in prison and they're as easy to get or easier to get than on the street. So that's how drugs get in prison. Guys like Reno who are running that whole and kind of thing. But it's funny because if they suspect you are bringing drugs in through the visiting room and they just got a suspicion that you might have did what that, you know, try to eat the, the balloons of dope and get it in, they put you in what they call a dry cell. What's a dry cell? Dry cell has zero water. You have to shit in a bucket three times before they let you out of that cell. And there's somebody watching you, literally watching you, 24 hours a day until you shit three times. There has been guys who would shit that out, try to break it up and then eat it to digest it. Because balloons don't, but they'd eat it and they'd literally eat the little pieces, try to do anything without getting caught. I mean, it's crazy. I told you one guy got caught with seven. The one guy who stuck stuff up his ass, like a, uh, a suit casing, one guy, and, and I saw it come out, he had six quarter rolls. You know what a quarter rolls are? 
stuffed solid with weed. And he in the visiting room, he stuck six quarter rolls up his ass. Because it goes up your anus, and then it goes up your digestive tract. But, and it came out, six quarter rolls came out of his ass because I was in the cell when he kept coming out. And I go, holy shit, how much can you take out of your ass? Obviously, we know now. I mean, he had six. That is, I mean, it's driving crazy. So then you have Shanks. You know, everybody carries a Shank. I mean, listen, in a maximum security prison, Shanks are Where do you get Shanks? How do you get them? You can make them out at a machine shop. You get them off of a corner of a locker. You know, there's a, a metal thing. Sometimes it rusts. You can break it off. Fences, the fence pieces, that, that wrap and tie a fence, they're taken off and they're wrapped together and they're putting a piece of wood in there. It's a real good poker. They call them a poker. So I had three shanks. I kept one shank outside my door. In Atlanta, it had old cells. So there was a pipe running outside my cell. So I would keep one shank taped there, always ready. I kept another shank in a coffee mate. You used to be able to buy coffee mate, like a coffee creamer off the commissary. And I would put, I had a shank in there. And I usually kept the shank on the yard. Now, obviously on the yard, having a shank, you, you know, it's good to have it out there. But you, you know, when you really know something's going down, you better know you, you're gonna bring your own shank to the yard. And here's why, first of all, the prison finds shanks on the yard. Here's how they do it. When inmates are locked in their cells, when all the guys are locked in their cells, the four o'clock count at night or whatever, they run metal detectors all around the yard. Obviously, if you have a shank, it's gonna be detected because it's metal. And But here's what you do. In prison, we keep, if you ever look at a prison show, they have the pathways, the concrete pathways. So what we used to do is we used to keep a piece of wood, which was the handle for your shank, along the path under the dirt. We'd put it along the path under the dirt. And that's the reason you do that is because when they run a metal detector around that, up and down the paths, it's not going to come up. If your shank was in that piece of wood, it's going to be found. So what we did, we put the shank there, that the handle on the yard, and then you would suitcase a shank. You put it in the toothbrush holder, put the steel shank in the toothbrush holder, you'd wrap masking tape at the end, you'd insert it in your rectum. Now, you'd, the reason you have to do that is you gotta get to the yard. Well, going to the yard, there's three metal detectors. So when there's three metal detectors, you go through the first metal detector, what happens? Beep, 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 it goes off. Get out of line. Now the whole line's backing up, but they get out of line, stand there. Now, there's another guard over there, and he says, strip. You got to go over there. It's like in a passageway or wherever. And landed at a passageway right there. Strip. Take your clothes off. Mom, lift your nuts. Turn around. They can't see anything. They're too busy to... They're never going to do a cavity search. That, that, that's a whole process. So they don't know if you have a fake uh, knee. You know, you had a metal knee because you had an operation or whatever it is. Or maybe you've been shot. A lot of guys in prison have been shot. Still have a bullet in them, so that's going to go off. So they just say, the check-in is, get the fuck out of here. Now you go, you go through the next metal detector, you do that. Now it's still in you, you get to the yard. Me and two other friends, if I was your friend, we'd, we'd sit around and uh, I would squat like I'm tying my shoes. I'd like bend down while I'm tying my shoes. And right where that area where I had my handle, while I bend down, I pick up that wooden handle and I'm also, cause you're, you're wearing shorts or whatever it is, you know, you have shorts on and you literally just squat and you take that, that toothbrush holder out and you got it. Now you just quickly put it in your pocket. Now it's in your pocket. The wood is in one pocket or the other. Now you walk in the yard, there's 300, 400 people on the yard, whatever it is. And you start taking it away. You, you got guys cover for you. You take it out of your, of your toothbrush holder and you keep that because you need that toothbrush holder. That's your transportation system. So you take it out of that, you, you put your shank in that piece of wood and you got your shank, you got your ready to, to fight. The reason I tell that story is because if I didn't know to do that, I wouldn't be here telling you this story and I'd probably be dead. Because what would happen is I, uh, 
I was on a yard and I knew a dude was beefing with me and I knew he was going to try to get me. So and I'm not going to run from him. I'm not going to go to the cops. I'm not going to not do what I do in prison. I'm not going to keep myself doing what I do. And sure enough, he tried to do something. And I had my shank and we both squared off. And that instance, you see people spread out and, and we're ready to fight. And then we got my shank and the guards see it. And they, the bull hunger. Get down on the floor, get down on the floor, image. You know, and, and the alarm goes off and all, you know, the guards come running. It's get down, flat on the floor. And you better get the f down because if you're not down, they will shoot. They have beanbag guns, but they have real guns in those towers. They don't f around because I've heard the shot go off on a yard, man. And that, that's a scary thing. You don't know. You're dead. But anyway, if the guard, if I didn't have my shank, he would have had to have jumped on me quick. And, and, and shank me and, you know, who knows if he's going to kill me or not, but that's going to happen. So that's why people think, you know, why do you hide a knife up your ass? Why do you do, you know, no, I don't like to hide a knife up my ass. No, I didn't like to do the things I did, but you know what it's called? It's called survival. It's called the survival of the, of the fittest. Well, everybody, I hope you liked that part of the chapter. Uh, we have another part of the chapter coming out on Sunday morning at 8 a.m. We have new videos coming out every Sunday and every Thursday at 8 a.m. We also have a couple of other great videos in the hopper, me doing a GTA video as well. So I think this is gonna be really exciting. Some really good stuff coming. Also, I'll let everybody know I have an Instagram account and you're gonna see some cool pictures of me in prison and they're all prison pictures way back from the 90s and, and uh, even the early 2000s. That's pretty cool pictures of me in prison. That's at Real Larry Lawton at Real Larry Lawton for Instagram. Check it out. It's going to be a lot of stuff coming there too as well. This has been great. Uh, can't wait to, you know, keep doing these videos and giving you guys some um, food for thought for this criminal justice reform and also, uh, you know, prison, prison system stuff. We need to fix that too. Thanks for watching. Can't wait to see you guys next time.